what happens if there's a Eurozone collapse. The consequences would be unimaginable. And I've always said, well, go on, let's have a try. You know? Welcome. Welcome. From Alpha, From Alpha to Omega. To Omega. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the second episode of my new podcast, From Alpha to Omega. I'm Tom O'Brien. Today, I'll be interviewing for the first time a fellow Irishman, David Korowitz, to talk about the possible collapse of the global economy. Cheery stuff indeed. The interview was recorded a couple of weeks ago, so some of our talk of fuel shortages caused by a fuel tanker strike in the UK may seem a little out of date. My apologies. But before we begin, the small print. On the website, you can sign up to receive email notifications for new episodes of the show. You can also join the From Alpha to Omega group on Facebook for some two-way interaction. I would like to thank everybody for their feedback on the first episode of the show. My good friend Emmett O'B pointed out that it was unclear exactly what the philosophy of the show might be. The world we live in is a complex, complex system with many different specialities that I find intriguing and important. It is these subjects I would like to talk about, be they economics, philosophy, mathematics, politics, science, genetics, energy, peak oil, etc. It is only by looking at the full spectrum of knowledge available to us can we hope to understand the world and I suppose this podcast will reflect those things I find important and interesting this week I was extremely surprised to receive my first donation after the very first episode of the show I would like to thank Marco L for his very generous donation I'm much obliged I also received my very first subscriber the lovely Precious J. So, to the interview. David Korowitz is a physicist and human systems ecologist working out of Dublin. He is a board member of FASTA, the Foundation for the Economics of Sustainability, and CORE, Ireland's Sustainable Development Council. He contributed to the excellent FASTA book, Fleeing Vesuvius, Overcoming the Risks of Economic and Environmental Collapse and was also the author of Tipping Point, Near-Term Systemic Implications of a Peak in Global Oil Production, which has been cited by the German military, amongst others. His latest research has the working title Trade-Off and discusses the contagion between financial collapse and trade networks. David, could you speak to the role of peak oil in the 2008 financial crisis? Well... Firstly, if there was no peak oil, what we were in was a growing global bubble, a credit bubble that was tied in with global imbalances, by which I mean that China was lending to the US so it could buy Chinese goods and you kind of, they got locked in a trap because China probably knew that its money that it was lending to the US is more and more risky, but to stop giving it would mean its own current production could be retracting. In the developed world, a huge amount of expansion in credit, which we were using for consumption and for speculating on houses and other things. Now, really, that sort of thing has to burst. Bubbles eventually burst, whatever causes them, because it'll hit some sort of buffer. Now, what happened in 2008 was that there'd been this huge increase in oil prices and correlated with that food prices. Now, what that does, firstly, we have to think that fuel is not like any other commodity. So in other words, if the price of books rose and rose and rose, we just stop buying books and it wouldn't affect so much the rest of the economy. But Fuel is right through every single physical thing in the economy because everything in the economy requires energy. When fuel prices rise, it affects 
everything in the economy. Everything becomes a little more expensive. So what people do firstly is, if you've a certain amount of earnings and everything becomes more expensive, starting with fuel directly and food, but leaking into other purchases, you start to have to cut back. And what you generally will cut back on is what is your most discretionary income. Books or restaurants out or holidays. And that meant that there was less income in restaurants, less income for leisure activities, so people lost jobs. It also made it a little bit harder for people who really were on the edge with their mortgages to actually service those mortgages. So that is how it directly affected people. But for a country like Britain, now that's a net importer of, of energy or the United States, or so most countries are, it means that, well, you've got to buy it, so you're sending more money abroad. That, you could say, is like money leaks out of your economy to pay for that energy. More is leaking out as the price rises. That means there's a little less money flowing through your economy. So they'd be the two sort of direct economic reasons of what a high energy or oil prices do. More fundamentally, you could say, if you put on a scientist's hat, you say, well, your economic activity requires energy. If there's less energy flowing through your system because you can afford less, less work done, so in, in effect, you had a, a credit bubble, which was somewhat uh, removed from the oil price, and also then a spike in oil price, which caused that bubble to burst. That's exactly it. It would have burst by something. It had to. One of the other things that energy price rise did was cause a rise in the price of food globally. So you can track They jump along together, the World Food Price Index, with effectively the price of oil, and they rise and fall very closely, they correlate. The Arab Spring was initiated, its prick, the prick to popular discontent, was rising food prices. It was one of the driving factors that initiated it and brought that anger to the surface about a lot of other things. And that, in a sense, also fed back into oil prices, because if you remember in Libya, at the time, Libyan oil exports were reduced, and that added to the pressure on oil. You see these, these sort of things, sort of, it, there's the big effect, the direct effect, and then these ricocheting effects throughout various parts of our socio-economic world, and they can come back and hit us in surprising places. Today in England, we see the effects of a fuel embargo by a fuel tanker's driver's strike. Can you talk about how fuel is the lifeblood of the economy and how a short stop in the delivery of oil and petrol can affect the just-in-time delivery systems that we have in our economy today? Well, I think the case of the United Kingdom is very interesting because you've actually had a major fuel crisis before in the year 2000. And I think what you're seeing of this reaction is part of the memory of what happened 12 years ago. That really was a shock for the British government. And in fact, other governments, the Canadians, did reports on it. Because what they discovered was how something that we take so for granted, that there's food in the shops, that hospitals work, that critical services can be provided, all the things that are part of our banal, habitual world, could very, very quickly become unstuck. So what they found, for instance, was that fuel deliveries themselves were just in time. That means that four courts had their deliveries every day or two, more or less when they needed them. There was a little bit of slack. But also, not just the fuel, but all lots of the companies that were delivering, that relied on fuel, were also running on just in time. So what we lived in was a complex just in time economy. And that meant that you only had to kick at one thing. And this was really over a week that whole 2000 issue developed. 
it started to spread rapidly so that there were major warnings that supermarkets would empty. One of the interesting things was that they found the impact on society would start to become non-linear. So in other words, if it had gone on another couple of days, you would have found large parts of industry shutting down because they couldn't get spare parts or because critical employees couldn't come in. And this is another reflected not just the criticality of fuel, but also that in a very complex society, a society with many different elements that are codependent, breakdowns or cascading failure could happen very quickly. Looking at examples, you could say that, well, if the anaesthetist doesn't get into the operating theatre, the whole surgical team can't operate. And if the surgical team can't operate, a whole series of operations can't happen. That is part of complexity. There are lots and lots of different critical elements where the failure in one can affect the whole system, and so it can spread. So that is what happened in the fuel blockades in 2000, and it's also what is har- a harbinger of what's happening today. Now, what you see today, of course, is this, again, very strange bullwhip effect, whereby the date, or even if there is going to be a strike in Britain, hasn't been announced. However, it's kind of clear that in some places there may be no fuel this weekend, because people have panic bought, supply chain of the tankers can't respond when demand jumps 100% or 200%. There is going to be a gap in many places that can't be filled. So you're going to get a little glimpse of failure, even though it's largely driven by that process of fear, driving panic buying, driving fear. So that is an example of one type of supply chain failure. And it's a big one because it's so all-encompassing. But there are many others. I think one of the supply chain failures that really we haven't discussed as a society, and I'm sure it's being looked at, but quietly, is if there was a major financial collapse, we would be in a similar situation. People couldn't get their money out, trade credit would collapse, and it would spread to other banks, and you'd find people can't shop, shops can't resupply, businesses can't get petrol. So all of these issues about our dependencies on just-in-time systems in a world that is increasingly fragile from the financial system being straining globally to the emergence of a plateauing and a peak in global oil production. All of these things that are making the world more unstable, their impact is potentially greater because we are more vulnerable, because our dependencies are just in time. They're delocalized, they're spread all over the world, and they're very complex. Just in time, I found you just in time Before you came my time was running low I was lost, the losing dice were tossed My bridges all were crossed, nowhere to go Now you're here, now I know where I'm going, no more doubt or fear, I found my way, love came just in time, I found you just in time, you changed my lonely life that lovely day. or fear I found my way love came just in time I found you just in time you changed my lonely life that lovely day you changed my lonely life that lovely In your report, Tipping Point, Near-Term Systemic Implications of a Peak in Global Oil Production, 
you detailed three models for the peak of oil production. Can you tell us about this report? Well, what I wanted to explore was what is the implication on economies from a decline in affordable and available oil. Now, before I explain the implications, I just want to make a point that people get kind of confused because it's kind of an idea that we'd like to believe in. So they might say, well, oil is peaking, sure, but there's lots of reserves out there. They've heard of the tar sands or they've heard of shale gas or all of these things. Our real point for looking at the effect on economies is that we need a real-time flow of oil, not promises, not what might be available, not what technology could provide, but what we have real-time. Real economies run on real-time flows of energy. The other thing is, if we say, well, can you substitute the oil that we need for growing or the oil that is being lost to depletion with other types of energy? Well, then we need to know, can we substitute it on time? Can we substitute it with something of similar energy quality? Does it have the same energy return on energy invested? So that these sort of questions and the general consensus by those who are looking at these things is, no, we can't. A gap opens up between the energy that we need for growth and for economic economies to keep doing what they're doing and what's available. So the question then is, well, what does this gap mean? Now, the three models for one is, well, because we know of the link between energy and economic activity, we'd say, well, as energy declines or as oil declines, the economy contracts sort of linearly with it. That is, for every step down in energy flowing into the economy, there's a corresponding step down in economic activity. So, for example, if oil production falls 2%, GDP might fall 2%. Yeah, or some factor proportional. The second one was oscillating decline. And that was sort of saying, well, you know, you can imagine that energy being in short supply and we need it. So there starts to be constraints on oil. So the price rises in oil and indeed in food. Okay, so it raises up the price, economic activity drops, and when economic activity drops, demand for energy drops. So what you have is a drop in demand for oil and a drop in its price. So boom, first you have a high price, then tush, you have a low price. That gives the grounds for the economy to start picking up again, and it picks up again, and it hits a new constraint of where oil was, so the process repeats itself. So you have this very chaotic up and down, up and down, so it oscillates, but it's declining also overall, so it's a decline with an oscillation superimposed upon it. The economy swings from recession to a bit of growth to recession, and down and down it goes overall. The third model I used was one of a systemic collapse. Now, this sounds frightening, and it has a lot of cultural association, zombies being one of the most popular, but I mean something very particular by it. What I mean is a really relatively sudden drop in complexity or in economic activity. There are various reasons for this. There are systems that are adaptive to a growing economy that we depend upon. And once growth really becomes impossible or is seen to become impossible, the system doesn't contract, it starts to break down. And one of the most rapid and high-speed systems like that, one that there's already huge constraints in, that is already vulnerable, is the global, not the British or the American, but the global banking system, global monetary stability, the whole system by which we can trade, which is money and credit. And this is for a very direct reason. Our financial system is based on credit, which is a promise, promise of tomorrow. That's how money is injected into our economies. It's how banks work. It's how our economies work. So this is the system of fractional reserve lending. Yeah, but that's the banking system. But all of the whole thing is just credit. So we can issue credit between businesses and Because everything is credit, and most of what we use to transact is credit, and it's 
given out at interest, if we're to pay back that credit, we need even more credit because we've got to pay the interest. So we live in a system that requires continually expanding credit. But if that credit is to maintain its value in buying real goods and services, we want GDP to increase in concert with it. Now, we really have, at this moment, a profound disconnect between real GDP, the goods, and the amount of credit. Already, this is becoming untenable, and that's why there are strains in the banking system, strains in sovereign debt, and worries about monetary stability. But if there's way too much credit in the system compared to the amount of GDP, and what peak oil does is actually undermine GDP, i.e. real economic activity, that really just blows open the whole gap. The most likely resolution of that sort of impossible scenario is that there is, at some stage, a run on the global financial system. And that would be people either rushing to get their money out of banks, investors, pension funds trying to drop their assets because effectively they realise the value of them can never be delivered in real goods and services. And you have a global financial collapse and it means monetary instability because money is just it's really just digit in a computer or a little bit of it is paper or coins. And this point, this sort of detonation point, is growing closer all the time. In this scenario, we see the likelihood of a global run will lead to a type of hyperdeflation. Well, now, as I see it, at, at the moment, we are in a deflationary period. All that means is people are paying down loans. So that's kind of taking money out of the economy. At the same time, people are borrowing less because they're already, in many cases, are up to their teeth in it. There's less new borrowing, which means less money supply entering the economy. So you can see the money supply is being squeezed because people are paying off, people are not borrowing anymore. And the third thing is people are holding on to their money. They're not spending their money. So when they're not spending their money, it's not circulating. So it's squeezed from both ends and less circulation, which means less economic activity. And that has its own dynamics. It means more businesses go bust, more people become unemployed. What that does, well, that makes people even more fearful. The amount of lending gets even narrower, or they're defaulting, which means the banks have to write down their capital, so it becomes spiral. So that's deflation. Now, all that could happen if you've this deflationary environment. Now, at some point, it may be the case that various things happen. You might have, for example countries in the eurozone getting so frustrated say we're going to introduce a new currency another thing is you could get hyperinflation i think the best thing to say is globally we're going to into an era of more and more monetary uncertainty that means there becomes greater risks of inflationary episodes or even hyperinflationary episodes of currency reissues of all sorts of things but the settled dynamic at the moment is deflation. So we also see some some types of cost push inflation. So, for example, the price of oil again is skyrocketing at the moment. These two forces, one deflationary and others inflationary, seem to be caught in some kind of a battle. Well, this is what's kind of so interesting, also deeply worrying, is if you have a deflationary episode, there's less money about. And on top of that, you start to get a rise in prices of the most fundamental things you need, so energy and food. What you're doing is actually kind of almost putting an accelerant on that. Not only is there less and less money flowing through the economy, it's being squeezed. So the non-discretionary part of our economy is hit from multiple sides. I think the issue on oil, it's not exactly transparent at the moment because there's a lot of things going on. One is we are plateauing in oil. There's still growing demand, especially in Asia. The amount of oil cannot meet rising global demand at a much lower price. The second thing is there is real worry that the global financial system could start to come apart, no matter what the latest calm is. 
And what you would do if you were really worried that banks could go down, that you might have inflation, all of these things, is you would put your money, if you were an investor or a hedge fund, into something real like oil or food. And the third thing is that because peak oil and even the economic issues are so sensitive, you're not going to get very straight answers from people who do know, because if David Cameron, for instance, were to stand up and say, you know, we have an oil crisis on our hands, it would do to financial markets what the little warning of a fuel strike in Britain did to the four courts of the UK. It would cause panic and it could start to initiate some of the dangerous collapsing processes that could really tip off a cascading effect across much of the global economy. Does this mean that collapse then is somewhat baked into the cake if any action to deal with the collapse in effect causes the collapse? Uh, I think there is, that is one fear that I would have. It's part of the reason why managing this sort of crisis, I don't think it is manageable, but dealing with it, dealing with the predicament is so difficult. But I think in general, complex systems of all sorts do collapse rather than contract. And I think there are very good reasons for saying, thinking that this will happen with the global economy as a global system, because it really is a global sis- integrated system. Um, however much we talk about our national or local economies, they exist interdependently. They are The British economy is an expression of a global system. It doesn't have an independent existence. And it is that global system that I worry will start to fragment and fall apart. Is this part of my investigation? Yes. Say this blanket represents all the matter and energy in, in the universe, okay? You, me, everything. Nothing has been left out, all right? All the particles, everything. What's outside this blanket? More blankets, that's the point. Blankets everything? Exactly. This is everything, okay? Let's just say that this is me, right? And I'm, what, 60 odd years old, and I'm wearing a gray suit, blah, blah, blah. And let's say over here, this is you, and you're, I don't know, you're 21, you've got dark hair, etc. And over here, this is uh, Vivian, my wife and colleague. And then over here, this is the Eiffel Tower, right? It's Paris. And this is a war, and this is a, a, a museum, and this is a disease, and this is an orgasm, and this is a hammer. Everything is the same, even if it's different. Exactly. But our everyday mind forgets this. We think everything is separate, limited. I'm over here, you're over there, which is true. But it's not the whole truth, because we're all connected. Because we are connected. Sure, 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 sure. Okay? Yeah. All right, now, we need to learn how to see the blanket truth all the time, right in the everyday stuff. And that's what this is for. Why? Why what? Why do I need to learn how to see the blanket thing all the time in the everyday stuff? Well, you wouldn't want to miss out on the big picture, would you? We need to be careful that we don't think because we're human and brilliant and super, somehow we exist in another parallel universe to the other complex, brilliant, super and wonderful things that happen on our planet. Our globalized economy is one part of a class of things called complex adaptive systems. They include natural ecosystems, they include the human body, they have particular periods of stability and instability, they can collapse, they can regroup and reform. All of these things, there's a general language to look at complex systems. And I think one of the things is, We're like all of those. We can learn from those. We can learn how to look at our economy from that system's perspective. And one of the reasons why it's useful is that because we've assumed the globalized economy, we look at parts of it. We don't really look at the whole or see how lots of broad things fit together. We tend to miss out on a lot of key relationships upon which our welfare depends. So that a systems approach is I think, an appropriate way for looking at such a complex system, especially when its stability is in question. One of the defining metrics for stability in a complex system is nutrients, energy, because that really is what complexity, what growth depend upon, is flows of energy to keep those systems complex and to keep them growing.
How do increases in economies of scale increase the level of complexity in a society? Firstly, the good thing about economies of scale, about the growth in complexity, it's not that long ago, only a couple of hundred years ago, since many communities in Europe had mini famines and major food shortages. And that was because most communities were very relatively isolated from each other. So that if you had, for instance, in your village flooding, for instance, because you were generally poor, a subsistence liver, with weak links to elsewhere, areas of surplus couldn't distribute to your deficit. And so you went hungry. What growing complexity did, which is really a response to problems. So if we have a problem, and you have the tools to respond, so you start to build a road or build a boat to go along a canal, and you start linking. Well, the first thing, having more links to wider networks, to wider towns and villages, and they connect them all together, that means one of the first things you can do is, well, you can have more division of labor. And we know that as Adam Smith wrote, well, if you have division of labor, it frees up resources so that you could have, rather than a community of generalists, farmers, people could start to specialize in boat building or in breeding horses or in making textiles. And that brought extra economic activity. And you need a certain amount of economies of scale, more connected people to do that, because obviously in your village, there'd be no point having one boat if it had nowhere to go. It needs to connect to get its value with lots of other villages and people. And so with many other things. So you could specialize if you've economies of scale. It also made, you know, many more people could share the cost of building a canal or building a market. So the cost per person was less so that the relative value they could get out of it was more. And obviously more people mixing, more people interacting together, they could start to do more complex projects. So the boat builder would get to meet the financier in the town and they would be put in touch with the sack maker and they'd realize if they got an investment, they could bring all their skills together and go on much longer trips and build a bigger boat, etc. So all of these, this growth in complexity, this growth in wealth, was a reinforcing thing. And it also obviously depended on energy and resources. But as it built up, as you get more technologically able, you have bigger economies of scale, you can start to be more ambitious in how you get your resources. You can travel further afield. You can mine deeper or you can develop new technologies. So, so there's this growing process of economies of scale. Now, what we have now globally is we have global economies of scale. Most of us aren't working on the land or digging coal. Most of us aren't providing our basic primary needs. We're all supporting this complex world. We're sitting in think tanks. We're doing all sorts of things that this complex, wealthy society can do. Now, if you had a retraction in growth where we're spending more and more of our declining income on food and on certain energy services. So that means that there's less and less economic activity to support the networks. But the networks have the same size as they had before, and you still have to look after them to give them upkeep. So that starts to become harder and harder. They lose economies of scale. Now, I can give an example. You can imagine in an economic crisis, we all have our mobile phones. Imagine we all started to lose our jobs, or lots of us. Or some of us became poorer, and we said, look, I can't really afford to spend so much on my mobile phone. I'll use it less. So the amount of money coming into the phone networks and the back, particularly the backbone, critical infrastructure side, gets less and less. But the cost of maintaining the whole network is pretty similar because it's fixed stuff. It needs the same hard input. It's not that labor intensive. That means that of the people who are remaining, who haven't dropped out, well, they've to spend the same amount or nearly the same amount to upkeep the network. So that means their prices have to rise, which drives more people out. But the costs will have to be maintained. So the general costs have to be paid among even fewer people. And so you get this feedback or cycle where the economies of scale of infrastructure can no longer be met and 
it starts to become increasingly and very rapidly difficult to maintain the infrastructure. And we can also see it in other things. I mean, one of the differences between now and the Great Depression in the 1930s is in the United States, you know, about a third of the population were working on the land. And then there was a whole relatively, well, not too complex, other group of people around them, the people who had the cart right or the people who had fix machinery, etc. When the economy started to attract more and more, there was a bedrock of people producing the foundations of what people needed. Now, of course, we have very few people producing the bedrock of what people need, so that the change into globalized economies of scale, the change in specialization and wealth, means that any economic contraction could relatively be much harder because most of us are actually, or more of us, are providing the most non-essential parts of what societies need. We saw the impact that peak oil made to the collapse of the former Soviet Union. What can we expect for a collapse scenario today for us, given the fact that our society has become ever more globalised and also the fact that we have seen 20 more years of increased complexity. When the Soviet Union collapsed, it wasn't cut off from the outside world. It had reduced links and it was less complex as a society. So it was easier for it to pick up. It was also, once that little chaotic period started to calm down a bit, they could really equilibrate with a strong, confident global economy that surrounded them. Now, one way I look at this as, you know, the way the body repairs itself. So if you get a scratch or a cut, your body is very good at coming in and patching up the damage. For the Soviet Union, it was, could be considered within the globalized economy as being pretty damaging rip, I suppose, in the global fabric of exchange. But because it wasn't absolutely central to the functioning of the rest of the globalized economy, still surrounded by that continent economy, the repair process could occur. It could re reequilibrate, And you see this, I mean, through various ways. When One of the ways Zimbabwe, during its hyperinflation, eventually to start to re-equilibrate was to grab a hold of the US dollar. And that allowed it to find some sort of stability. So the corollary of that is, if your body is damaged either extensively enough, you can die. Likewise, if the damage hits what we would call a key hub in the global economy, or a keystone species, we might say, in an ecosystem, the body could die or start cascading failure. And there you might think of the heart or the brain or the liver. In our globalized economy, where we're so interdependent, if I were to shut down or put a ring around the United States or Britain, not allow anything in or out, economies would collapse within days. Where the, the key hubs that integrate all of the global economy, well, we might think about them. One is the global financial system and monetary stability. And we've become ever more dependent as things have become more complex. Of things have be, as our dependencies have become more high speed and as our dependencies have become delocalized. We need things that we depend upon, even if it's not directly come from across the world. That would be a key hub. Another key hub would be critical infrastructure. And obviously you could lose it in a place, but if it started to spread, it could affect lots of other things, which could affect lots of other things. And that would be a cascading failure. So really, we're more in damage because what we risk is not the failure of a part, but part of a cascading failure that goes not to in the edge or in the periphery of the global economic system, but to its heart. And that is both a heart in terms of what's being hit in terms of energy or the financial system, where it's being hit in terms of it's not the periphery of the economy, it's the most critical part, it's Europe, it would be the United States, Britain. So that's where our risks happen. And also, they're likely to happen when they happen very fast. So they say, in general, about complex systems collapsing, that they can last a lot longer than people expect, but they also can fall apart much more rapidly than people expect when they do finally start to fall apart. That really is where our challenge lies, is that we could find ourselves forced into a rapid relocalization 
but we're not, we don't really have the ability at this stage to do anything in a local way. I mean, our, our systems are adapting for a globalized world. And that really is the point of where a society would hit a massive catastrophic shock. And this, one hopes, is where some of the area that we might be preparing to deal with so that we could come through it. We would be much poorer, irrespective of what happens, but we could come through it without being really totally just devastated. If you were thrilled by the towering inferno, if you were terrified by earthquake, then you will be scared shitless by the Samuel L. Bronkowitz production of That's Armageddon. The most realistic depiction of death, doom, and destruction in motion picture history. See George Lazenby as the architect. I tell you this building is unsafe. Jack Roberts as the governor. Governor, the city's in flames. The National Guard's powerless to deal with the situation. The dam is threatening to burst. The airport has been seized by terrorists. And the nuclear power plant's about to blow in a second. Governor, what are we going to do? Donald Sutherland as the clumsy waiter. What are you saying? Leave her. Come back to Montana with me. I can no more run away from her than I can run away from myself. I'm not asking you to run. I'm asking you to face reality. Whose reality? Yours or mine? My reality and yours. That's whose. What are you saying? You will never forget. That's Armageddon. So in your model for systemic implications of peak oil, you talk about oscillating decline. That's the peaking of oil prices, which caused the economy to go under stress, and then oil prices fall down because of less demand, and then a peak again. This seems to be the pattern with we're in at the moment. And if, if we imagine each one of these peaks as a kind of a shock to the body, the economic body, is it likely that we'll get a shock such that we'll move on to the collapse part? That's how I see it. I really think that the oscillating bit is the early stage, part of the early stage stressing. That eventually starts to become more erratic and wilder as other things are infected, where there's other cascading effects, where the system as a whole becomes more unstable. So start to have food crises, causing revolutions, all of these sort of things starts to have lots of other effects that start to be, it becomes more and more difficult to predict, it becomes more chaotic, and then you get more and more likelihood of major catastrophic things happening, like a global systemic banking collapse, currency crises, that really could see demand drop very, very quickly globally over the course of a few weeks, where you, know, you could see global trade running to a standstill while people worked out what the hell was happening. That would be very, very difficult to reboot the longer that sort of trade went down. Those risks are rising. But I think at the moment we're in sort of the deflationary period. We're in the period of kind of oscillating decline, but it's a relatively small oscillation. And I think it, what we can expect is growing instability generally, growing capacity to be surprised, growing risks of monetary uncertainty and defaults, and ultimately growing risks of major catastrophic happenings and events. And we should never forget, you know, we really can't predict the future. What we're doing is saying, look, these are the conditionalities. For all I know, yeah, we might be hit by an asteroid next week and none of this will happen. As societies, what we need is to start to absorb, may not be coming out of recession, that things get a lot harder. And it is our natural inclination because we want to put order in a complex world. We've also got very accustomed to historically enormous levels of wealth even for ordinary people in developed countries, that you know, we don't like giving it up. We think somebody's doing us over, or there's a temptation to think that. But that I think even with the best political leadership, with the wisest planning and leadership, 
we would still be facing great problems. We would still have to live in a world that's much poorer. We would still have to live without the sort of healthcare system in terms of its complexity that we have now. There would still be periods of mass unemployment because we're living and adapted to a very different economy that cannot exist. So that even with the best one in the world, there's no magic solution. And in a sense, there's also no one directly responsible. This is part of our journey as a human species. We've been warned about these sort of constraints for decades, decades upon decades. Generally, we've took the easiest option and said, well, we let somebody else deal with it or we hope something will happen. Or, well, I'm generally very good dealing with the environment, though I do like an occasional holiday in the south of France. So we all share some sort of responsibility for what's happening. I don't think we should beat ourselves up over it. But I do think we need to start saying, well, as a society, how are we going to deal with this in the best possible way? How are we going to not get caught up in too much anger, too much scapegoating, and rather say, look, if we're going to go here, it's probably going to happen whether we want it or not. How are we going to do it in the best way for all our welfare so that collectively we do our best to look after our collective welfare? When uh, the Soviet Union basically fell apart, there was an ideological alternative as well at the time. At the moment, we don't have any developed alternative ideology. So into this vacuum, what role do you think military power might play? I think it depends where you are. If you're in a culture where the military is more present, better prepared, is better armed, it's more likely that military power will play a bigger role within that country. Well, firstly, I'd say internationally, I don't really get the idea that there will be lots of huge international wars over oil or anything like that. I think actually we'll find that there might be plenty of oil. What it's done is oil constraints and financial constraints have tipped all sorts of other cascading effects causing economies to collapse. And there'll still be an overhang of oil production available, etc. But I do think at home, societies under stress are open to all sorts of outcomes. And I'm reminded of an interview I heard a few months ago of a woman on the streets of Greece, and clearly very distressed, and one's heart would go out to her about what was happening. And she was saying, and of course, Greece's experience of this, uh, she wanted the army called in to deal with the problem in Greece. On the one side, you could say, whatever the government know about economics, I imagine the army know even less. But I think what she was getting at wasn't an analytical point. She was getting at something that was emotionally very real, that we ignore at our peril. I think to her, the army represented order, control, stability, the very things, the lack of those things that were making her and so many of her compatriots feel scared, disorientated. And in those times, be it the army or be it the leader who has all the answers, that is one of those great risks that people look for radical clarification of what is innately complex and uncertain. The other side of that sort of top-down military side is in a time of crisis. So if you have your fuel blockades, if that goes ahead, you'll find the army in Britain are delivering fuel. Now, in a real crisis, the army are generally the people who are charged with, could be supplying food, keeping certain things open, ensuring critical supplies are protected and delivered. If it becomes a prolonged crisis, which is what you would expect in a collapse, you could find, oh, they've come to help the army. They're here to help us collectively. But they start to become part of the established fabric of things. And that can be dangerous, which one sees in other countries where the people with the guns also end up with the power and it can be a source of corruption or a source of incredibly anti-democratic or anti-collective things. Not that it initially started out like that, but that's how it might evolve. The other side is where there is just state failure. And state failure is where the army and everyone else can't deal with the issues, give no response or such a feeble response that societies and communities are left on their own. Now that raises its own dangers because it opens up predatory groups or gangs or whatever. We, we need to be careful not to be too romantic about localization as 
we will all just localise and somehow everything will be all right. Largely, I think, one of the reasons is we're all in the wrong places. So you might live in a lovely little local community off in the countryside where you can feed yourselves, but there may be lots of city people who are looking and saying, how come you've got all of this? So I think it's hard to know where things will fall and how things will fall. Maybe it'll probably be a mix here and there of these sort of stresses. But I know it might look like, wow, this is kind of scary stuff. It's things we don't want to deal with. But actually, if we can talk them through, it makes us more resilient because we can get to know ourselves and know some of the the values and the virtues we and our neighbours have and also warns us of some of our own demons that we can collectively keep a look out for. Hopefully with that, we can both prepare and kind of psychologically prepare ourselves to find the better outcomes rather than the worst. David Carvitz, thanks very much for coming on the show today. Thanks very much.